we start our studies of chemistry by taking a look at the atom. And our understanding of what makes up an atom has been refined over time um, as science and scientists and technology have evolved um, to help us kind of see, okay, well, well what's this atom all about? Um, scientists like Dalton, Thompson, Rutherford, and Bohr have all made significant contributions to our understanding of what is an atom. The word atom itself comes from a Greek word that means uncuttable. In fact, atoms are the smallest particle of matter that still retain properties of that matter. So for example, if we're talking about gold, okay, um, an atom of gold is the smallest piece of gold that will retain all the properties of gold. What are these properties? Well, how shiny it is, how malleable it is, um, that it conducts electricity, all those kinds of properties, the color gold, gold is gold. Um, you can cut up or, yeah, I guess divide um, a chunk of gold down right to the atomic level if you're able to. Once you got down to one atom of gold, that would be the last, uh, the last form of, of, of the substance that would still retain properties of the gold. Okay? That doesn't mean that atoms are the smallest thing that exists. In fact, there are these things inside atoms that we call subatomic particles. So all atoms have within them protons, neutrons, and electrons, okay? So three subatomic particles, that means that they are found within the atom. We'll get back to this chart in two seconds, but just wanted to tell you a little bit more about modern atomic theory, and that kind of lends itself to what we'll take a look at in that chart. The size of the nucleus of an atom is very small compared to the size of the atom as a whole. Okay, but the mass of the nucleus is equal to the mass of the entire atom. Interesting. More on that in a second. And then uh, last point for modern atomic theory and atomic structure is an atom is electrically neutral because the number of electrons is equal to the number of protons. What does all that mean? Well, let's take a look at what are these subatomic particles? Um, where do we find them? What are they all about? before we make sense of those next two statements. Um, in science, in, especially in chemistry, we're always looking for ways to abbreviate words or names um, by using symbols. So our symbol for a proton, for example, is a P with a little plus sign. Why does it have a plus sign? Because every proton has a charge of a one positive charge. You could also say if you really want it, same, same, it has a positive one charge. It doesn't really matter where you put the sign. Okay, relative mass of a proton. So we're going to say the relative mass of a proton is one. One what? Well, let's not get hung up on units of, of measure there, okay? That you can take a look at in future chemistry courses. Okay, where are protons found? What is their location? They are found inside the nucleus. So they are found in the nucleus of the atom. You know what else is found inside the nucleus of an atom is a neutron. Let's talk about a neutron. I know that's jumping around a little bit, but whatever. Okay, a neutron we can symbolize as N with a little zero. Well, why is there that zero? Because a neutron has no overall charge. In fact, it is neutral, which sounds a lot like neutron. So that's how you can remember that. The relative mass of a neutron is also one. Again, we're not super, super worried about units. Okay, so both protons and neutrons are found inside the nucleus of an atom versus an electron. So let's talk about electrons. If we want to abbreviate electrons, it's an E with a little negative sign. Why? Because electrons have a charge of negative one. Okay, what is the relative mass of an electron? 
relatively, compared to protons and neutrons, electrons are so, 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 so small that we say that they contribute zero to the whole mass of the atom, whereas each proton and each neutron contributes one to the mass of the atom. And where are these electrons found? They are found not inside the nucleus. They are found orbiting the nucleus. And our pals Rutherford and then Bohr, um, their research uh, shows that that's where we find electrons. Not in the nucleus, but taking up um, orbits outside of the nucleus. And in fact, making up most of the volume of the atom. So when we say something like, um, hold on, I think I just need to erase this first so that we can go on to the next slide. When we say, point number two, the size of the nucleus is very small compared to the size of the atom, um, but the mass of the nucleus is equal to the mass of the entire atom. So if we're drawing an atom here, Standard shape for an atom that we draw tends to be a circle. So if we draw that atom and then the nucleus right in the middle, okay? So this nucleus, when we're looking at it, you can see that it doesn't, first of all, let's spell that correctly. Nucle, oh my gosh, I'm just gonna start over. Never mind, ignore that. You ever spell something so many times and then you're like, that can't possibly be the right way that it's spelled. That's what we're going with anyways. Uh, that is how it's spelled. Okay, so there's the nucleus of the atom. It's teeny tiny compared to how much space is uh, the whole atom takes up. So this nucleus has our protons and it has our neutrons. And then this whole, I'm just going to shade it in. These are not electrons. This whole, like, quote, empty space outside the nucleus. It's not really empty. Well, it kind of is because um, electrons are on the move throughout there, okay, in their set energy pathways. That's what Bohr told us, okay? Here's the analogy I was told. You can look into this further if you want, if you want to fact check, okay? If the nucleus of an atom was the size of an ant, you know, a little like six-legged insects, okay? You could put it on, uh, in the middle of a football field, and then the whole atom's size would be um, like the length of the football field, okay? So just bear with me on like a poor drawing. Here's a football field. There's like an end zone and another end zone. And here's the halfway line. Okay. If we put our ant, aka nucleus of the atom, on the size of that football field, the rest of the football field would be then this quote empty space for electrons to take up. What I'm trying to get at here is nucleus takes up very little space but has all the mass. And then electrons float about in the rest of the volume of the atom, um, the size of the atom, but they have relatively no mass, okay? Why is this important? Why is this important? Well, let's take a look. Because we can actually figure out protons, neutrons, and electrons that we find in an atom uh, based on some of this information. So we're going to talk about two uh, different numbers um, that every atom has, I guess, kind of related to itself. Okay, so first number that we're going to talk about is called the atomic number. Okay, the atomic number is the number given to an element on the periodic table. So if we're looking at our periodic table, we can see, for example, hydrogen has an atomic number of one. It's written in your periodic table on the top left corner. Okay, if we just continue to go down that column. Lithium has an atomic number of three. Sodium has an atomic number of 11, so on and so forth. 
interesting. But these numbers weren't just like arbitrarily assigned to these elements, okay? It wasn't like, ooh, hydrogen. You're the first element that was discovered. In fact, it wasn't. Um, so we'll give you atomic number one. That's not how these numbers were given. The atomic numbers were all given to, um, to various elements based on the number of protons that they had. So when we see, for example, hydrogen having atomic number one, that means there is one proton in an atom of hydrogen. One proton in an atom of hydrogen. Okay, so fairly significant here. The atomic number is equal to the number of protons. We've discussed all of that. So where does this last part come from? Okay, well, it comes from a previous statement that we made where because atoms are electrically neutral, they have no overall charge, our number of protons that have a positive charge must equal the number of electrons that have a negative charge. Positive charge and negative charge must equal each other in order to, quote, cancel out, therefore giving us what we call a neutral atom. Take home message, all atoms are neutral, no overall charge. Therefore, all atoms must have the same number of protons as they do electrons. How do we know how many protons? Well, that's given to us by the atomic number. So that's the first significant number that we see um, when we are talking about atoms. The second important number that we see is called the mass number. Mass number, again, significant here, I'll put a little star beside it, make sure you have that written down. Mass number is equal to the number of protons plus the number of neutrons um, found in an atom, okay? So it's the total amount of protons and neutrons. It's not the atomic mass. I know you guys are all going to look on your periodic table and you're going to find atomic masses there, okay? Um, they're the number that's listed with two digits after the decimal. Um, and you want to tell me that that is the mass number of the atom. It is not. I cannot stress this point enough. I'll just keep underlining it. And then maybe somebody will listen someday. Maybe. Okay. So the number, if we're back looking at our pal hydrogen again, okay, hydrogen's atomic mass is 1.01. .01. That's its atomic mass, yes, correct. That's the number given on the periodic table. That is not the mass number of hydrogen, okay? How do I know it's not the mass number? Again, because mass number is the sum of number of protons plus number of neutrons. These substances, these subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, electrons, only come in whole numbers. So there's no whole numbers that you can add up that give you 1.01. .01. It's not like it has one proton and 0 0.01 of a neutron. That's not correct, okay? So atomic mass, maybe I should underline this part a million times too. Atomic mass and mass number are not the same thing, okay? Mass number is determined um, doing a little bit of math, protons plus neutrons. Atomic mass is given on the periodic table and that is another topic for another day. Hopefully I've underlined enough. So let's take a look. Let's take a look using our knowledge about subatomic particles, where we find them, how they give us info about atomic number and mass number, or how mass number and atomic number can give us info about all of those. And let's see if we can figure out um, the unknown pieces of information in this chart. What we see here okay, in this chart is that we are given some information. Each of these rows represents a, a brand new element. So we're given some information, but not all of the information for um, three different elements. Okay, let's fill in the rest. First example that we have here 
Okay, the symbol is Li. So let's look in our periodic table to find out, okay, well, which element has the symbol Li? Hunting, hunting. We've already talked about it this lesson. That's my hint for you. It's lithium. Okay, if you still haven't found it, I'm going to help you out. The atomic number is three. It's right underneath hydrogen. Okay, the next column I asked to fill out here is the mass number, but I don't know that just yet. Okay, it is not 6.94. I have a stern eyebrow raised. I want you to picture it. Okay, it's not 6.94. We have to do some math. Remembering that mass number equals the protons plus the neutrons. So let's figure out, oh hey, that's fun. They've told us there's four neutrons. Well, let's figure out how many protons there are. How do we do that again? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Number of protons equals the atomic number. Okay, so if the atomic number of lithium is three, then the number of protons must be three. And you know what's very interesting is in fact, the number of electrons, I'll just use that shorthand, is also equal to the number of protons and the atomic number. So three protons, three electrons for our friend lithium, which has the atomic number of three. Now let's go back to the mass number, okay? And let's figure out, um, let's figure out what the mass number would be. We've got three protons, we've got four neutrons. Quick math here, three plus four is equal to seven. So the mass number for lithium is equal to seven. Hopefully we feel great about that. Okay, you know what? I have a typo in my next, could you imagine such a thing? In my next example, 48 is not the atomic number. 48 is the mass number, has to be, or we're not going to get this one right. We're going to get pretty stuck. Okay, 48 is the mass number. Bear with me. So now, our my second element here, okay, we've got something that has a mass number of 48. That's not very helpful. I can't really find that on the periodic table. But I'm also told that I have 22 electrons. And if I know that I have 22 electrons, okay, and that the number of electrons must equal the number of protons. That means I have 22 protons. And if I have 22 protons, jumping over here, my atomic number must equal 22, okay? Then that helps me find which substance I'm talking about on my periodic table. I'm just going to jump over, take a look at the periodic table, find element number 22. Turns out it's titanium. That's fun. Last thing, let's figure out the number of neutrons. How do we do that? Shoot. Well, I'll tell you, if we know this information about mass number being equal to number of protons plus the number of neutrons, we can just kind of rearrange that to solve for, well, how do I figure out the number of neutrons? Neutrons is going to be equal to the mass number, maybe some of you have figured this out already, minus the number of protons. So here, I have a mass number of 48, and I have 22 protons. Oh gosh, I've been put on the spot with this math. Four minus two, okay, Whew, not as bad as I thought. Okay, 26 neutrons for um, an atom of titanium. Okay. Last example, gold. Ooh, we've already talked about gold today. That's fun. Gold, where are you? Oh, there you are. 
Oh, I've messed up gold as well. Oh my goodness. Somebody fire me immediately. Okay, gold has a symbol AU. Okay, I'll tell you what gold doesn't have though. An atomic number of 197. I must have been partly asleep when I did this. It has a mass number of 197. Its atomic number though, kids, is 79. How do I know this? It's right on the periodic table. So if you can find it, it's kind of in the middle there. Okay. Atomic number 79, which means an atom of gold will have 79 protons, 79 electrons, and then we have to do some math to figure out the number of neutrons. I need a calculator for this one. And what I come up with is 118. Okay, 118 uh, neutrons for an element of gold. So what you guys can do is you can take a look at more examples, just really getting used to this idea of how do I, A, use my periodic table and find substances on it, B, how um, do I figure out mass number, atomic number, and then the number of all the different subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons for each, um, for each of the different atoms? Okay, so make sure you get some practice in with that. The more work we do now, the easier chemistry becomes. And I know right now it seems like a little bit of a headache, but you just have to trust me on this one. Now that we have a bit of understanding about subatomic particles, um, we want to start talking specifically about electrons. Why? Because we care about them the most. But why? Okay, so it's important to know that the number of electrons, or sorry, not just the number, the total electrons in an atom um, is what determines how that atom is going to behave and react with other substances. So that's why we care so much about electrons. Um, it de electrons determine kind of reactivity, how um, an atom is going to form compounds, all that kind of fun stuff. When we talk about electrons, we can represent the electrons in an atom two different ways. Okay, we can use Bohr diagrams, and I'll just um, jump to give you the other option. It's a Lewis diagram. So these guys are both named after a couple of scientists who knew a few things about electrons. We've already talked about Bohr, okay, and we've talked about how his major contribution to um, our understanding of the atom was that atoms orbit the nucleus in energy levels. So it should come as no surprise that we're talking about Bohr diagrams. We're talking about these things called energy level diagrams. Okay, these energy level diagrams show us, they give us a visual representation about how the electrons situate themselves in different energy levels around the nucleus. Where are they? Okay. Um, one fun thing to know I'll star this, you should make sure you have it written down, is that the number of energy levels in an atom is the same as the period number that it is found in. Remembering that um, when we're talking about periods in the periodic table, we are talking about the horizontal rows. Okay, so there are seven periods in the periodic table, which means maximum number of energy levels that an atom could have would be Seven. Okay, so number of energy levels is the same as the period number. That's pretty important. That will help us out. Um, we can draw a circle to show the number of protons uh, and or nu neutrons uh, to represent the nucleus of the atom. We don't really care about protons and neutrons when we're doing uh, Bohr diagrams or energy level diagrams. What we really care about is the electrons and where we find them. Okay. We have to know, though, that every energy level has a max capacity, okay? Um, and 
wouldn't it be nice if it was the same max capacity for every energy level? Yes, that would be nice, but that is not how it works, okay? Energy levels have different maximum capacities. For our studies right now, okay, we're going to say that the first energy level can hold a maximum of two electrons, two electrons. Any more than that, they got to go into uh, other energy levels. So we can take a look at the second energy level and third energy level, which for our studies will have a max capacity of eight electrons per. The other thing I'm noticing that's not written down on this slide is that we, um, when we're taking a look at energy level diagrams, okay, we fill, don't worry, we're going to go through some examples. So if this sounds foreign, it should, um, but we'll go through some examples so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. We fill from the inside out, which means we have to have a full first energy level before we can move on to a second energy level. And we have to have a full second energy level before we can move on to the third energy level, okay? So we fill from the inside out. First energy level, second energy level, third energy level, okay? Let's take a look at how this operates. So taking a look at our Bohr diagrams, we have to be able to determine how many electrons are in a particular um, atom, okay? So let's start. Carbon is our first example. Carbon is atomic number six, so find that on the periodic table. That tells me that it's going to have six electrons, okay? So I'm going to draw my nucleus here. Thinking about my color coding. Yeah, I know what I'm doing. I'm going to draw my nucleus here. Okay, and I'm going to say that I've got six protons for carbon. Let's not worry about neutrons right now. That can be a different problem for a different day. Then what sometimes is helpful to do is to draw your energy levels in first um, before you start talking about, okay, where are these six electrons going to go? So I can look at my periodic table. I see that carbon is in the second period, so it's going to have two energy levels. There's energy level one, there's energy level two, okay? Now, you can draw uh, your energy levels as like, it's sometimes seen as drawing them as like concentric circles around your nucleus, uh, but in the interest of not taking up 1,400 pages, to do all these drawings, I'm just going to use straight lines, okay? So yes, these should go all the way around the nucleus, and they do go all the way around the nucleus. I'm just trying to conserve some space, okay? Um, okay, where do these six electrons go? Well, we know that we have to fill from the inside out. So here's the first energy level. It's the one closest to the nucleus. Max capacity is two. And I have to put two in there before I start moving on to a different energy level. So I'm going to have two electrons in this first energy level. That's how I write it. If you're keeping up with the math, we started with six electrons. We've put two in the first energy level. Now, the rest of them, because there's only four left, will have to go in the second energy level. Okay, remember that energy level, the second energy level has a max capacity of eight. It's not full, four is less than eight, friends. Um, so we're going to keep all four of those electrons in the second energy level. So that would be our Bohr diagram for carbon. I'm going to do chlorine next. I know that's out of order, but it also has a lot of electrons to deal with. So I thought I would be kind and do a question that, maybe is a little bit harder. We find chlorine on the old periodic table here, and we can see that we somehow have to get 17 electrons in there. Okay, well, let's draw our nucleus and also put our 17 protons in there. When I look at chlorine, I can see it's in uh, period three, so it's in the third row on the periodic table. 
So I'm going to draw my energy levels in before I start putting electrons. Um, and I'm going to need three energy levels. There we go. So now let's figure out where do these 17 electrons go. Okay. First energy level, max capacity, two electrons. Okay. So 17 minus 2 gives me 15 more electrons to put in. Well, let's go to the second energy level. It cannot hold all 15. Okay, it's got a maximum capacity of 8 electrons. So I'm going to dump 8 more into this second energy level. So now I've placed a total of 10, which means I have 7 left. Where are those going to go? All of them will be able to fit in the third energy level. So I'm going to write them in the third energy level like that. So it's not necessarily harder. It's just there's more electrons to place. Okay, all of these were going through the same steps. If you'd like, you can pause the video here. I'm going to work on um, oxygen and lithium just so you guys have the answers. And then if you want to work on them on your own, pause the video now. Then you can hit play, come back, rejoin, and um, check and see how you did. So oxygen has eight electrons, which means in my nucleus, I'm also going to need eight protons. Okay, And oxygen is in the second period, so it's going to have two energy levels. I'm going to be able to put two electrons in the first and the remaining six electrons will go in the second. So that's our energy level or Bohr diagram for oxygen. For lithium, lithium has three electrons so it's also going to have three protons in its nucleus. It's also in the second period so it is going to have two energy levels, and I'll put my electrons in there. Two electrons, max capacity in the first, which means our remaining electron goes in the second energy level. That's a Bohr diagram. Okay. Now, drawing all these electrons is so time-consuming, and you have to count things and keep up with the math and this, that, and the other thing. Wouldn't it be nice if there was a faster way? And in fact, there is, okay? So, this other guy named, last name Lewis, came along and he said, wow, drawing these Bohr diagrams takes so long. And you know what? We actually don't even care about electrons unless they are valence electrons. Okay, what is that? Okay, a valence electron is the electrons that are found in the outermost energy level and that outermost energy level is called the valence energy level. So valence is a sciency word that means outermost. Okay, um, and our valence electrons are the only ones that we really care about. The interior electrons in other energy levels, we don't really care about them. And Lewis recognized that. And he said, well, why are we wasting our time drawing, remember this guy for chlorine, right, where we had 17 protons and then we had two electrons in this energy level and eight electrons in this energy level and seven electrons in the outermost energy level. Let me write this in big red letters. Okay, that's our valence energy level, and therefore those are our valence electrons. Lewis said, yeah, I don't really want to talk about these innermost electrons. Okay, they don't really do much here. What I do want to talk about is the valence electrons, because those are going to be the ones that are going to, going to determine how bonding happens. How will chlorine, for example, that I just drew, how will that bond with other, um, with other substances, with other elements, okay? So 
With our Lewis diagrams, first of all, we are compressing things by only caring about the valence um, electrons. Okay, secondly, you're gonna love this, we're not even writing E minus to abbreviate electrons. Lewis said, I don't even have time for that, I'm a busy guy. I'm going to represent these electrons by drawing them as just dots. Okay, he didn't even have time to write E's, he just only had time for dots, that's how busy he was. Okay, so what's going on here? Well, first of all, we need to be able to figure out how do we figure out how many valence electrons? Because we certainly want to, don't want to go through that math, that like filling order, two electrons in the first energy level, eight in the second, eight max in the third. Okay, we want a faster way of figuring out um, our valence electrons that we have present and we can do that we can do that the number of valence electrons in any atom um, that we're going to look at can be determined by the last digit of the group number so for example if we are looking at group one remember groups are the vertical columns in the periodic table if we're looking at group one elements like hydrogen lithium uh, sodium, potassium, so on and so forth, they are going to have one valence electron. The last digit of one is one. That sounds weird, I know, but pay attention to this. What about group 14? Carbon, silicone, germanium, so on and so forth. Well, the last digit of 14 is four, and those guys in group 14 are going to have four valence electrons. Okay, so there's your shortcut. Last digit of the group number equals number of valence electrons. I would write that down if I were you. That is a hot tip. You heard it here first. Now, Remember, Lewis, very busy guy. He wanted to make these, um, these diagrams as fast as possible. Okay, so he said, let's write the atomic symbol, those letters that you find on the periodic table, to represent the nucleus of the atom, so all protons, all neutrons, as well as all those inner electrons that it turns out we don't care about. Okay, so just by writing CL, for chlorine, for example, that is representing in a Lewis diagram the nucleus as well as those 10 inner electrons. Then he said, we're going to place these valence electrons, which we are drawing as dots, on the four sides of the symbol. So think of the symbol as having four sides, top, bottom, left, and right. Okay. Last rule is that each side must have one electron before any side has a pair. There are some exceptions. Um, hopefully I remember to discuss them with you here. Okay, but I don't want to talk about exceptions until we talk about what's actually going on. Okay, got to know these rules before we jump into our examples. Hey, wait, these are the exact same examples that we just finished doing for our uh, Bohr diagrams. Yes, I did that on purpose. Um, okay, let's start. Let's start with carbon. Actually, you know what? We've been talking about chlorine a lot. Let's start with chlorine here, okay? So I'm going to draw my symbol. That is chlorine. C, and I write my L's when I do, um, like, atomic symbols in chemistry as a handwritten L so that people don't think it looks like an I, okay? So that's why it's written as a script. So chlorine, atomic symbol, Cl. Chlorine's in group 17. So even if we hadn't just figured out how many valence electrons chlorine had, uh, has by doing the Bohr diagram, we could just look and say, oh, hey, that's in group 17. So therefore, it's going to have seven valence electrons. I'm going to draw these electrons now. Remember, we've got four sides, top, bottom, left, and right, and each side of the symbol has to have one electron before any side can have two. So I'm gonna draw one, two, three, 
four, okay, each side has one, now I can start doubling up or pairing them, if you will. Five, six, seven. Ta-da! There is my Lewis diagram for chlorine. Okay. Let's take a look. Let, now let's go back to carbon. So carbon, atomic symbol C. How many valence electrons? Well, it is in group 14, so it's going to have four valence electrons. So I'm going to draw one, two, three, four. Again, top, bottom, left, and right. Each side gets one electron before any sides pair up. Okay? If you want to tackle oxygen and lithium on your own, you feel free to pause the video right now. When you're done, hit play again, come back, and you can take a look at uh, if you were right or not. So oxygen, symbol is O. Oxygen is in group 16. So it is going to have six valence electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six. Cool, cool. There they are. Now, if you did your drawing, for example, let me do this in a different color so you guys. If you did your drawing, right, and you maybe, let's say you came up with something that looked like that. Are you right? Yeah, you're totally right. It doesn't matter where you put the pairs, okay, versus where you put the single electrons, as long as you've got six valence electrons for oxygen, every side has uh, one electron before you start pairing them up, okay? So it would be problematic. Let me see if I can. It would be problematic if your oxygen looked like that. That's not correct. Okay, we're not just going to have three pairs and then one side with nothing. Okay, so that's not right. But to have your pairs in a different spot, totally okay. Okay, up next, lithium. Lithium. Don't get your dot for the eye confused as a dot for an electron. That's why I like to use multiple colors. Maybe you will too. So lithium, group one, just one valence electron. And you could put it on whichever side. I'm going to put it over there so that it doesn't look like it's a dot for the I. Okay. So there you have it. Bohr diagrams, taking a look at all of the electrons in an atom and assigning them to energy levels based on filling from the inside out and each level having a maximum capacity. And then Lewis diagrams, taking a look at only valence electrons, so those electrons in the outermost energy level, representing them as dots, and then combining those dots with the atomic symbol to come up with our Lewis diagram.